Hello, beloved. Thank you for having journeyed with us throughout the season of Lent in 2023. This is Holy Week. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, Monday of Holy Week, our liturgical readings are from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 42, from verse 1 to verse 7, and the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12, from verse 1 to verse 11. So, this is the final week in the earthly life of Jesus. It is six days before the Passover, the very Passover in which he will be crucified. And he has come to Bethany where Mary and Martha and the recently resurrected Lazarus live. His disciples are with him and Judas Iscariot is among them. And they are standing on the brink of the greatest event in history, the death of Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world and his consequent resurrection from the dead. In the previous chapter, chapter 11 of John's Gospel, we have the account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Because of the proximity of Bethany to Jerusalem, the word of this miracle spread through Jerusalem like wildfire. So the chief priests and the leaders were planning to kill Jesus. But because his time had not yet come, Jesus moved to Ephraim for a couple of weeks. So when we come to the 12th chapter, his time was now close at hand. So Jesus is coming. Jesus came to Bethany. He will die at this Passover. And this is the point where the Passion Week really begins. Chapter 12 to the end covers this final week. So everything gets very intense from here on. John presents Jesus as the only savior of the world, the only hope of eternal life. In the first 11 chapters, there is the constant relationship between faith and unbelief. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is so extreme that it leads to eternal life beginning right here and onto heaven. Not believing in Jesus Christ is the other extreme and it leads to eternal death beginning from here the death of separation from the life of grace and it culminates in hell now in chapter 12 these extremes become crystallized in the characters that we encounter in this particular chapter. Jesus Christ causes faith in some and elicits unbelief in some, while in some others it is pure indifference. So, in today's reflection, let us break the characters out of the story a little bit. This incident in John's Gospel is also recorded in the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, having come to Bethany six days before the Passover, there is dinner in his honor in the home of Mary, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Martha as usual, is doing the serving while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with Jesus. 
Matthew chapter 26 and Mark chapter 14 tell us that it happened at the house of a man named Simon, the ex-leper, who also lived in Bethany. So, why would Simon host such an event? Because he also has experienced miraculous restoration, the healing of leprosy. And lepers in this time in history were considered to be living dead. So as it were, Simon had also been raised from a certain kind of death. So there are two very special people reclining at dinner table with Jesus. One is an ex-leper and another is an ex-dead man. Then you have the Lord Jesus right in the middle. Now that should make for some great conversation between the three of them. This meal was a special one. These two persons at table with Jesus had experienced personally God's creative power. And Martha is serving. What stands Martha out is the service that she gives. Martha serves the Lord Jesus Christ. However, Martha often gets the bad press in Luke chapter 10. The Lord had come to Bethany. Martha had welcomed her into their home. And her sister Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to the word of God. Martha, having been distracted and uh, agitated with all of the preparations, came up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the seven by myself? So tell her to help me. You know, Martha seems to be a little obsessed with the seven stuff. But the Lord responded and said to her, Martha, Martha, you worry and fret over so many things. But there's only one thing that is necessary. And Mary has chosen the better part and it's not to be taken away from her. Let me tell you something. The truth that Mary is listening to, the truth of the word that Mary was listening to with Jesus is forever. The meal and the stuff in the kitchen that Martha was obsessed with has a short shelf life. It is not eternal. It is transient. It's temporary. So my brothers and sisters, instruction in the word, divine truth, listening to God is priority for the true believer. If you really want to be a good disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will have to listen to God. Because faith, as St. Paul says, comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Based upon that experience, we sort of degrade Martha a little bit. Martha served then. And on this particular occasion, Martha is serving again. But let's not be too quick to degrade Martha because of her serving. Because service is actually regarded nobly in sacred scriptures. 
You see, true faith is accompanied by service. Let me see that again. True faith is accompanied by service. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 from verse 27 to verse 28, Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just so, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, in Luke chapter 22, verse 27, he said, For who is greater, the one seated at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one seated at table? I am among you as the one who serves. The nobility of service is also emphasized in Luke chapter 12, verse 37. And Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says to serve one another in love. You see, as believers, we are all called to be servants. We are all called to be slaves of the Lord and servants of one another. Martha will always be remembered for her service because that is Martha's nature. Sure, Mary was more reflective, probably even more spiritually minded, but Martha was a doer. And thank the Lord for doers. Thank God for those who serve. I read a story of a kingdom that was under attack from a neighboring king who was more powerful with a bigger kingdom, a bigger army. And the king that was under attack had to make an appeal to young men in the kingdom to join the army. An old lady who had the king's appeal went to the palace and met with the king and said to the king that she had an only son, but she wanted her son to be enrolled in the kingdom's army. The king was stunned to see such patriotism and he gave his permission. Now, a vicious battle took place and this old lady's son sacrificed his life for the motherland. Eventually, the king who was under attack won the seemingly impossible battle. And the victory was so powerful and so intense that it completely weakened the army of the, the, the kingdom that had come up against them that was more powerful and bigger. When the old lady went back to the palace, she was in tears. And the king tried to console her, knowing that she had lost her only son. But the old lady said, and I quote, I'm not crying, O king, because my son died. I'm crying because I had only one son. Now I won't be able to give any help to the kingdom in a time of crisis. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that amazing? In John chapter 12, verse 3, the text says, Mary took a litter of costly perfume oil made from genuine aromatic nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and dried them with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. It strikes me that there is such a detailed description of what Mary did. Do you know 
that God actually enjoys the details of a person's sacrifice and devotion to him. God remembers everything that we do in his name. Now, I don't really think, I don't really think that Mary's action was premeditated. I think it was as a result of a heart that was bursting. Bursting with unrestrained love. It was this unrestrained love and appreciation that drove Mary to make such a sacrifice. Dear friends, faith, true faith in God requires sacrifice. According to scripture scholars, this kind of perfume that Mary brought to anoint Jesus' feet was used at funerals to prepare a body for burial. Nard was a very rare herb that was grown in the high pasture lands of India. And because it came from such a far distance and it was so pure, it was also very valuable and very expensive. In fact, its value was known by the man who always thought only about the price of things. The value of faith was known by Judas. Judas said, this perfume is worth an entire year's wages. Now, Matthew's gospel tells us that this perfume was in an alabaster jar. Alabaster is a carved white transculent stone that contains this nard. The alabaster itself was also very costly. So, the jar was costly, the oil was even more costly. And both put together was the sacrifice that Mary was giving. Mary's heart was overflowing with love and gratitude. She's behind the scenes at first. And now, all of a sudden, she makes her entrance. She smashes the alabaster jar and breaks it open. And Matthew and Mark tells us that she, she went to the head of Jesus and, and began to pour the oil on him and was drifting all the way down. And then she began also to, to anoint his feet. This is such an amazing and lavish expression of love. And then she losing her hair, which was a radical thing for a Jewish woman to do in the presence of men. And she used her hair to wipe his feet. This was in complete disregard of Jewish rules. Mary's love knew no boundaries. Mary's love had no limits. Mary's love was extremely generous. She gave everything of value that she could lay her hands on. There must have been stunned silence in that room. You see, as I said earlier, I don't think this action of Mary was premeditated. Mary did not just decide to randomly go and anoint him and give him everything. There was a clear relationship between Mary and Jesus. She sat at his feet. I'm sure on more than one occasion, she listened to him. She learned from him as her teacher and as her friend. Mary experienced 
great loss when her brother died. And when Jesus showed up days after, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days when he showed up. And he brought such great consolation, comfort, and joy to the family. You see, the deeper Mary's relationship, the more, the more this occasion meant to her. Mary's action was out of love that has grown over time. It was a love that was rooted in trust. And this love and trust was what pushed her into this action of complete self-abandonment and surrender to Jesus as Savior. See, dear friends, Mary teaches us to give to the Lord our whole hearts and our entire lives. Mary denied herself of her most valuable possession and gave Jesus her everything. Everything. All that this world has to offer us is nothing compared to Jesus Christ. No wonder there's that popular song that says, take the world and give me Jesus. One devotional says of Mary, and I quote, Mary loved Jesus so much that she gave all she had. She didn't just pour out a little perfume to anoint him, she gave it all. She couldn't put that perfume back in the bottle. She had broken it. Maybe it was her inheritance or hope chest. She didn't hold back any for a rainy day or for her retirement. End of quote. Beloved, like Mary, you and I can give Jesus our all. Even if others do not understand when we give what we can, there may be plenty of people around us who do not understand. There may be plenty of people who will ask, why are you wasting your talent? Why are you wasting your gifts? Why are you wasting your time? Friends, don't let anyone stop you from sharing your gift the way that God has called you to do. You've got to do what you can. And you've got to do it with all the love in your heart. And in total surrender to him who is Lord and Master. Mary's offering was not well received by the other disciples. And this reminds us that as true believers, we are not in the business of awaiting human approval for our spiritual acts of worship. The only approval that we need is that which comes from God. Yes, we can be respectful of others. However, we answer first and foremost to the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples who thought this act of sacrifice was a waste, they missed out on the beauty of the worship that Mary was offering to the Savior. And I love how Jesus welcomes Mary's offering and shares its value. He comes to her defense. You see, maybe... Sometimes you feel like you are under attack because of your obedience to the Lord. Maybe you are under constant criticism by other believers. I know that feeling. And it can be a very difficult place to be. But ultimately, 
We do not serve human beings. We serve the one true living God. Mary knew what she was doing. When she took that alabaster jar, she had figured in her mind what she was going to do. The alabaster jar was of great worth, but Jesus was of greater worth to her. When we seek to follow Jesus, we need to consider, dear friends, what we are leaving behind. And be aware of the weight of that decision. We must place Jesus way and beyond every earthly value. Because the joy of, G of having Jesus in your life far outweighs the cost. Judas is identified by Jesus in John chapter 6 verse 70 as a devil. Judas was a man of greed, ambition, and self-interest. He came into the fold thinking that he would be wealthy. He thought that he would be elevated to some position of power, authority, and influence. And it began to become clear to him that Jesus is going to die. And Judas cannot have all the money that he wanted. So he queried Mary. When he said, why was this oil not sold for 300 days wages and the money given to the poor? And the text says he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He held the money back and he used to steal the contributions. Judas' argument may sound so noble. But John tells us that his intentions were not. He wanted all the money he could get before Jesus would die. Judas shows no appreciation for Mary's sacrifice. Mary gave. She donated a pound of expensive ointment. And Jesus came to her defense. While Judas valued money, Mary valued Jesus. Mary so loved the Lord that she gave the best that she had. Not the rest, the best. Not the leftovers, her best. Mary didn't hold back. Not, Mary was not like Ananias and Sapphira who brought the rest and not their best. So I ask you today, dear friend, do you value Jesus more than anything else in the entire world? Do you value time spent with Jesus in worship? What value have you placed on the Lord? And do your actions reflect your beliefs? Do your actions reflect the value that you place on Jesus? Does your life reflect that Jesus Christ is of the ultimate value to you? Are you giving Jesus your best? Are you being lavish in your love for Jesus? Are you sacrificial in giving to Jesus? Are you serving with all of your heart? And are you growing in faith like Martha who became not just a hearer but she was, became a doer of the word? Are you a doer of the word? How is your service to the Lord? Will you continue to stay in faith and keep in step with the master even in times of difficulties like Martha and Mary? Or will you quit being a disciple like Judas? Will you be faithful to the bitter end? And will you let God stand by you like Jesus stood by Mary? Let us pray. Give us a lively faith, a firm hope, 
a fervent charity, a love of you. Delete from our hearts every trace of lukewarmness and dullness and set our hearts on fire for you by the presence of your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Can I tell you something? Every year we run a charity for widows at Easter time. And we're doing the same thing this year. If you are led by the Holy Spirit to partner with us, then please be kind enough to send us a donation to be able to put smiles on the faces of as many widows as possible this Easter season. The details of our account numbers are on the screen. Join us in blessing some widow with the joy of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. And God bless you as you do so. Oh,